good evening and good afternoon from whichever part of the world you are tuning in from today welcome to the 68th session of the online optom learning series ols let me introduce to you our speaker for today today we have dr preeti kamdar she is an ophthalmologist who completed her mbbs and post graduation in ophthalmology from the famed lokmanya tilak municipal medical college in mumbai and then she went ahead with her glaucoma fellowship from the lv prasad eye institute hyderabad she is very blessed to practice as a glaucoma surgeon at the kamdar clinic which is almost nearing the century of the year it's in the 99th year which is a 99 year old institution and she also practices as at uh, jashem eye institute mumbai she has been an invited lecturer faculty in terms of glaucoma faculty at various national and international conferences and she is also also actively involved in teaching the post graduates her special interests being angle closure glaucoma neovascular glaucoma and glaucoma diagnostics and today she is going to talk to us about a very uh you know uh, interesting topic i would say it's visual field interpretation i think we as primary eye care uh optometrists definitely are involved in performing visual field tests and we will be the one who will be working or co-managing glaucoma patients specifically in terms of you know managing them with the specialist glaucoma specialist one of it is dr preeti and we will require you know tips on how are we going to go about interpreting the report which is very important to provide diagnosis and provide in inputs to our patients so thank you dr preeti for you know taking up this time and you know doing this session for us this is going to be one of the session uh, which we are running as a glaucoma series so we had dr arjun gokani who was talking about anti glaucoma medications and glaucoma evaluations about iop and the history taking in glaucoma patients and this will be continuing series uh, which i if i may put it that way in terms of visual field which is also one of the important uh, uh, manage uh, test in terms of uh, diagnosing glaucoma so let me just leave the screen time to you now thank you so much uh thank you uh, mr fakruddin uh, thank you for inviting me here and uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be with all of you so uh, without uh, wasting any time let me go to the um, main topic that is visual field interpretation now one is because you all are going to be performing the test when do we do a perimetry in whom do we advise so all patients glaucoma is one of the diagnosis i mean uh, the reasons why we have perimetry in our um, in our uh, clinics so all patients who have glaucoma glaucoma suspects ocular hypertensives all of them need baseline fields secondly unexplained optic atrophy in one eye why because there could be a tumor which causes optic atrophy in one eye completely and then expands and starts pressing on to the other optic nerve so when there is an unexplained optic atrophy in one eye we should do a perimetry for the other eye unexplained vision loss now it's so subtle i remember about a year ago i had a patient who was 6 by 4 okay and the only thing being in the 6 by 4 line he said he is seeing two letters which are crooked why i am telling you this is because any other patient like 6 by 4 uh, line i would have said okay if you can't read two letters it's all right i mean as it is your vision is better than 20 by 20 so this was a 6 by 4 patient but because he said that his um, the two letters were little crooked i did a perimetry and it showed early bitemporal scotoma so when i am saying unexplained vision loss it need not be something gross even 6 by 6 with little distortion they say uh, so my threshold after that case my threshold for doing a perimetry when there is even a mild vision loss is low so even in a mild vision loss i am doing uh, perimetries second is to differentiate between uh, different optic neuropathies and monitor compressive optic neuropathy is monitor glaucomatous damage these are the indications for when you will add order a perimetry this is a question which you, when 
now there are some tips initially when i bought the machine i did almost 500 perimetries myself means i was the one who was administering the uh, the the uh, test to the patients i was the one who was giving him instructions because unless you do it yourself you will not know what to instruct the person who is going to help you, help you so first and foremost is do the test on yourself you will be you will empathize with the patient when you say it's only 5 minutes to sit uh, and pay attention but those 5 minutes are of intense other performance intense so do the test on yourself you will know which kind of chair to use you will know what tips to use to make the patient perform better monitor values on the screen i'll tell you um, these days we do the ceta standard test i'll come to the details later but in ceta standard what happens is what the per patient clicks means whatever you see on the screen is not necessarily what you get on the printout why because the machine it doctors the test so what you see on the printout are not the actual patient values they are modified by the test after the person has finished doing the test so sometimes whenever there are high false positives you will get uh, sensitivities of 40 42 which are not humanly positive uh, humanly possible and when you take a printout they will go away because the machine has modified them so you are the only person who has seen those values and you know that the person is clicking unnecessarily the pay so that's why monitor values on the screen give breaks even if it is a 5 minute test give breaks ask the patient to blink because they are so anxious to perform well and they are so scared they're going to miss a, a miss a point um, a stimulus if they blink that they don't blink because they're not blinking their tear their, their eyes water and their vision gets blurry so ask the patient to blink give them breaks and after you have done a perimetry test please instill lubricating eye drops typically in my clinic what we do is we have perimetry then i examine the patient i check the pressure after that i dilate and then uh, uh, if necessary i do a perimetry and uh, because and then we go in for imaging so after perimetry the cornea becomes very dry and the oct which i do the quality of the oct is not very good the signal strength which i get is not very good so if you have done a perimetry before an oct you should wait for at least 5 to 10 minutes before imaging and instill lubricating eye drops so that you get a better quality of the image these are just some tips uh, uh, when you are doing a perimetry on a patient now i'm going to go into certain fundamentals not going to the depth because that can be got even from a textbook so this any perimeter any perimeter is based on the principle of differential light sensitivity what does that mean that if you have when you see the st- uh, the, the sky at night you see the stars and the same stars you are not able to see during daylight why because the background illumination is so high that you are not able to see the stars so similarly what uh, in a perimeter you have a dull background illumination and on super added on that is your stimulus the stimulus intensity will always be little more than the background uh, illumination and this is the basis of um, the test plus you are not you cannot compare one test from the other in different machines why because the background illumination of all the machines is not the same all right so uh, again we have a huge field but however most of the times we check only the central fields why because whatever affects the peripheral field also affects the central field so that's why most of the times we check the central fields what decibels you all know that when you see a printout you find the values are in decibels apostilles is the value of is a is a measure of the intensity of light like how mon- currency like a dollar rupee is the currency similarly apostilles are the currency for the intensity of light 
however they are converted into decibels because it's easier to express them as decibels and that's the reason we find the intensity of light is expressed in terms of decibels for example if i were to have one dollar i would see how much apples i can buy with one dollar and the intensity of that place is expressed in the form of apples and not in the form of dollars and this is another reason why you cannot compare the two um, uh, print out like you cannot compare octopus you to humphrey you cannot compare a medmon to humphrey because none of the machines express intensity in apostrophes they all express it in decibels less remember less is more lower the decibel brighter is the stimulus so if you have a stimulus which says 32 decibels it is dimmer as compared to a stimulus which is of 15 decibels that is what you have to remember threshold is the intensity of the light seen 50% of the times so if there was a stimulus which was presented at a, a particular uh, visual area 50% of the times if if the threshold is 32 decibels that means 50% of the times you will see it and 50% you will not see it and depending upon the threshold we also have values which are supra threshold means higher the intensity of light is higher than the threshold uh, threshold means it is stronger as compared to the threshold and you have infra threshold values which means the light is dimmer as compared to the threshold value so whenever you have a print out in front of you you have to ask these eight questions which is the test and what is the machine that is used then which i have uh, has been done is it reliable is it normal if it is not normal is it an artifact or is it a true defect does it follow a recognizable pattern actually these two together they go hand in hand that if it is abnormal if you have a recognizable even artifacts have a recognizable pattern and even a true defect has a recognizable pattern does it correlate clinically and the eighth is is it repeatable repeatability is the hallmark of a real uh, scotoma and an artifact is a shape shifter you may it will every time it will be different so let's come to the first question that which test and which machine uh, so before that we'll have a poll let which is the type of perimeter that uh, all of you use or mostly which you use So the majority of uh, the attendees are into Humphrey, about six percent, and seven percent of them use Octopus. Very little numbers use Medmond and Apasomi, and there are some others, other visual field instruments which have been used. Yeah. You know, right? So I was, uh, yeah, I would just then ask which is the others, but we will do it later. But I was right that uh, when I assumed when I started making this. Uh, talk that most of us use humphrey and that's why i have given more weightage to the humphrey perimeter interpretation so let us come to that but why do we need to know sometimes you will have a patient coming in that i have done this test so why do we need to know which test and machine has been used and that's because it makes a difference every machine has different threshold a different uh, background intensity and it also has for example now if you can see here where i am pointing my arrow you will find it is 10 decibels you will feel that okay this is not going to be uh, it's it's not zero at least but you have to remember that apasami machine the lowest decibel is not zero the lowest decibel is 10 so this point has already reached rock bottom you are it's not going to worsen more than 10 so this is one second is if you have seen this is an apasami machine and if whenever you have an apasami machine you will find that there are gaps which are not checked for example in the central part and in this mid peripheral part there are lot of gaps these are not tested so it helps to know which machine the person is use uh, which um, the patient has uh, used now 
this is another machine now where do we know where how do we find out you have to scan the entire the field report to find out which machine has been used now this is an octopus as it says here it is an octopus machine and octopus is one of the most beautiful machines why because the pattern which they started was so beautiful it's not a great pattern as we see in humphrey but it is according to the way visual field damage progresses in glaucoma so they have tried, tried to test those points which are at the highest likelihood of getting damaged due to glaucoma and that's why the pattern in octopus is the best among all the machines that i have used so this you have you know it's octopus and the another beautiful part of octopus is the baby curve we'll go into that a little later but this is what it is and sometimes you will have um, a printouts of which you have the machine you've not even heard of but you should be able to at least gain something by looking at this machine but the only thing you will not be able to know is that how robust is the database of this machine what we can say is that humphrey octopus medmont they have a very robust database and that's why you can trust those machines when you are using the uh, the statistical support raw data most of them can manage fairly well but the statistical support for progression and to find out how bad it is how, uh, what is the nature of the scotoma you may not um, get a fair idea with those which do not have a good database so this is which test and which machine i have come just to the machine now let us see and of course humphrey humphrey we know it is a grid pattern whether it's a 10 dash 2 or a 24 dash 2 it's a grid pattern now this comes to the machine what do you mean by pattern pattern refers to the arrangement of points in the visual field and as i said earlier each machine each manufacturer has used those points in their uh, test which they feel will help detect glaucoma the best so each pattern is different now if you i i said earlier this is the octopus it is not in the form of a grid and it is it it is in the form of crowded central points and sparse peripheral points along a particular area and this is where the points are distributed along the nerve fiber layer in the octopus machine but octopus also has another um, test because humphrey became so popular and the visual effect of octop uh, people were used to the grid pattern more that's why octopus also has a grid pattern so octopus has two patterns this is the g1 pattern and the other is a 30 dash 2 pattern so this is pattern means the arrangement of points in the test medmont medmont feels that it's not important to check the central points but it goes far out into the periphery so even if you are doing a 30 degrees in a medmont you will find that on the nasal side where glaucomatous damage is going to be maximum it checks even up to 50 degrees Apasami. Apasami has a different you can have it's in the form of this butterfly where in one pattern it has till 40 degrees you will see these points and this is another which is in the form of a circular grid so it apasami has different patterns full field again this is a pattern there is a difference between a pattern and a strategy which i am going to come to so why is this called full field 120 because it has 120 points and it is it checks up to 60 degrees the points are concentrated more in the first 40 degrees but there are points in the 50 and the 60 degrees zone also so all these are patterns which means it is the arrangement of points now what is a strategy strategy is the way these points are going to be checked so if you see we have two types one is the screening strategy means you do not want to check anybody in depth it is just a superficial testing 
if you are familiar with the airports now this is a form of a super screening test a superficial testing whereas a detailed checking where few points are few patient, um, travelers are selected and checked in detail now screening strategy what do you mean by screening strategy as i said it does it does not check the points in detail and what does this mean is these points there is one supra threshold point now what do you mean by supra threshold point a point which a person is definitely going to see and how does the machine detect what is the supra threshold point for this patient by looking at the patient's age in the patient's in the machine's database there is a certain threshold for a person who is between 60 to 70 years of age so the average threshold is suppose say x so the machine will project a point a stimulus which is much brighter than what the person of this age is supposed to see mm. and if the person sees the point it is an open circle if the person cannot see the point it is a black box so no further distinction is made no further attempt is made to quantify what is the nature of the defect so that is a screening strategy whether it is seen or whether it is not seen and if you see the result is here that the person has seen 20 points and has not seen 100 points out of the 120 points which have been checked and this was used earlier why because the threshold test took a lot of time now let me go to the next so what is as i said and where do you know how where do you know where is the screening uh, test so this is it's a full field 120 screening test and if you scan you have to scan the entire report and you'll find where it is in humphrey all of us know where it is but when you have any other print out in your hand you will have to actually look for it so what is thresholding in a threshold a stimulus is presented and suppose the person does not see it it is made brighter by 4 decibels till the patient sees it after that it is decreased in 2 decibels dimmed by 2 decibels till it is not seen so it has the seen to not seen um, threshold is crossed twice so once when is not seen to seen and the second time when the per seen to not seen so twice it has been crossed and the average of the two is taken as the threshold at that location now you can understand that this takes time so why 4 decibels you can certainly use 2 decibel precision and you will get a very accurate result and if you want to be still more precise you can use even 1 decibel and try to titrate it so much but however this precision will come at the cost of the time and the patient will be fed up of that test and that is why a threshold strategy um, though it quantifies the visual field loss it is highly accurate it detects small changes it is time consuming and it is difficult to do and that's the reason most of the companies are now coming up with shorter tests even though they want to threshold they are using smarter tests and because a, a, a type of artificial intelligence and because of that you save time and you because the person is doing uh, in a shorter time he is more as uh, you um, avoid artifacts because they do not get tired so full threshold is what was done earlier i will come to what is full threshold full threshold is exactly what i showed you earlier that you cross the threshold twice but however the fields took 10 to 15 minutes per i and that's why you came up with the ceta standard ceta fast and now it is ceta faster ceta faster takes still more um, still less time as compared to a ceta standard but in the humphrey i feel the ceta standard is what you should stick to now you have a 24-2 you have a 24-2c is a newer test i'll come to that later and 30-2 i will tell you what these tests are octopus is another is a very beautiful machine and it has normal the strategies i told you uh, strategies the way you are going to check and pattern is the arrangement of points 
so normal is a strategy again it was similar to full threshold and it took 10 to 15 minutes which was pure torture then is the dynamic test in octopus which is quite similar to the CETA standard and it takes about 5 to 7 minutes or sometimes even lesser if the fields are normal and then you have the tendency oriented perimetry of octopus which is one of the most beautiful tests which you can do in two and a half to three minutes but however you have to remember that any of these tests which are faster and which take less less time they come at a there is some compromise in data but because the person is able to do it properly you gain in reliability so CETA standard and the dynamic in octopus are the two tests which you should do tendency oriented perimetry is again a very beautiful test i would not use CETA fast i would not use CETA faster i am not very happy with these two tests now let me just tell you i'm just showing you one particular slide of full threshold because after that i'm not going to discuss full threshold most of us do not do full threshold now what do you do in full threshold look at this this is 10 and a half minutes and sometimes even 12 to 13 minutes have been taken the person gets fed up now what happens is how do you recognize that the field which you have in your hand is a full threshold uh, field one is uh, you will see these tests these parentheses in brackets why because in full threshold even otherwise even normally 10 points are rechecked again for threshold and because of and and why are they do uh, why are they rechecked because you want to find out what is short term fluctuation short term fluctuation means in the same session if i check the point again what is the difference in the threshold it means if I take one exam just now and after five minutes I take a repeat exam my score will be different it's not going to be exactly the same but what is the fluctuation between my scores in these two exams is given by short term fluctuation and that is a, also a measure of reliability I will not go into the details of this because we hardly use full threshold these days but when you see a printout you should be able to recognize uh, that this is a full threshold the first is on just visual impressions you will see these values in bracket one second is you will have short term fluctuation which you will not have in a CETA standard and you will have the strategy in strategy you will find full threshold written and not CETA standard so these are the ways you identify a CETA uh, sorry a full threshold test but again I'm, I will not go into the details of this again one more thing I wanted to um, now octopus octopus again very few are using of the current listeners are using octopus but I will say it again it's a very beautiful test where does it tell you that it is octopus right at the top you will find that there is octopus 300 series that is what the information it gives but if you see this what is the strategy strategy is top tendency oriented perimetry which is of which is the fastest strategy in a uh, in the octopus and see the beauty of it in only two minutes 30 seconds the test is done and believe me it's fairly accurate so this is how you're going to identify whether it is octopus what test it is whether it is a top whether it is normal or it is dynamic again in octopus also hardly people are doing a normal strategy what is being used is either a tendency oriented perimetry or a dynamic strategy dynamic strategy takes about as, as i said earlier four to six minutes top takes about just two minutes to four minutes and that's the beauty of the test now we'll come to the poll question that most of you how do you do the test do you do it with a, a dilated pupil undilated pupil or it's variable yeah so almost half 53 percent of them do in a dilated stage Yes. 34 undilated and 14 say that it probably varies. It's variable. That's right. Yes. So um, I do it in a dilated pupil. Why? Because um, 
it's a logistics part that if I do it first I do a undilated perimetry and then I do an imaging the waiting time of the patient goes very high and that's the reason that most of the times I know it's a glaucoma patient I dilate it the dilation uh, continues they do a perimetry so while they are doing perimetry they are also getting dilated and then they go for a scan so most of the times I end up doing a dilated uh, uh, perimetry with a dilated pupil so one thing you have to remember is the machine does not know you have dilated a patient so when you feed the numbers the refraction of the patient into the uh, machine it gives you a certain value that this is the ad you have to put in in front of the patient when you're doing it but if it's a young patient the the machine is going to tell you that he does not need any ad while doing the perimetry but you have to remember that you have dilated this young patient so you will have to give him an ad even though the machine is not telling you so that's the reason why i put this uh, because um, the the lovely girls who work with me they sometimes forget that madam there is um, the machine says there is no ad to be put yes but we have to put the ad because we have dilated the patient and we are doing the test so that's the reason that that's the uh, 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 message i wanted to give when i asked this poll question so we can go ahead with the rest of the presentation now the second question I, as i said is which third question rather which eye is it so you have to remember that if as if the patient is sitting in front of you your right eye is his right eye and you have to remember that the blind spot is always temporal so if i do not show this you will remember that this is the blind spot the blind spot is supposed to be the temporal part and this the opposite side is the nasal part so this is the right eye of that patient this is what you have to remember you will get visual clues also and of course the machine also tells you that this is the right eye but however in a 10-2 or in a macular test because it checks the central 10 degrees or 2 degrees and the blind spot is 15 degrees away from fixation you will not get any such clues and that is the time you have to be super careful that you are doing the correct eye and I mean you're putting the uh, eye in the correct uh, position when you're doing the test all right so always blind spot is temporal and you have to behave as if your right eye is the patient's right eye so if it is temporal to you it is if the blind spot is temporal to your right side it is the right eye if the blind spot is temporal to your left eye then that is the left eye that's how you have to remember which eye it is next question is it the correct patient so which is the machine which is the test which is the eye and is it the correct patient because you don't want even if you are not done the test you have the field in front of you you have to know whether it's a patient's field or no so for that you have to have one moment sorry okay so uh, this is the demographics of the patient all right this is where who's going to tell you whether it's a correct patient whether its age is correct most of the times i feel uh, I have seen that the pupil diameter is not entered, visual acuity is not entered and the, um, the refraction of the person is not entered. It makes a big difference. For example, if you, if you have a patient who is a very high myope, say minus 12, minus 13, they sometimes have this peripapillary chorioretinal atrophy and that's why they have an enlarged blind spot so if you have a if you have a scotoma next to the blind spot and you find that yes his um, it's a high myope you know the you know the diagnosis that why is there a scotoma around the blind spot so this is very very important most of the times this is not entered but i make it a point i was it was drilled into me into lb prasad that it should be entered and that's what i have followed and it has uh, reaped benefits so please do it always enter the pupil diameter visual acuity and the refraction now if you have one of those models where you do not have to enter the pupil diameter manually the machine actually measures the pupil diameter and enters this that is fine but visual acuity and refraction has to be has to be has to be 
um, uh, entered into the machine before doing the test. Now we'll come to one. Uh, this is spot the mistake. So if you can just this is not a poll because there is no multiple choice here. So if any of you can spot the mistake in this particular field, then you can just uh, put it in your chat box. I'll, we'll can have thirty seconds. Somebody says it's probably the age. Yes. Which the one person has enter has has said it correctly, um, Mr. Mahesh Ambarkar, mm -hmm. that the age has been changed manually. That's so true. So that's what I wanted to bring out that the age was the birth date was entered incorrectly and the person feels that just by changing it here you are going to make things better but no the the database changes every so a 60 to 70 year old will have a different database as compared to a 70 to 80 year old so what is going to change un go unchanged is this this will not change the raw values will not change, but all the statistics which the machine is offering you will go completely different. So manually, you should not change. There is in Humphrey, it gives you a chance that you can go back even after the test is done. This test does not become worthless. Even after this test is done, you can go back, change the date of the uh, date of birth of the patient and you will get a renewed, a totally new um, no, statistical interpretation so this is completely wrong this should not be done that was the point behind showing you this so we have answered three questions now you want to answer the question is the test reliable so we have something called as how much can I trust this test is the question you are asking so once you have made sure you know the machine you know the test you know what you have done patient dem demographics are correct and now you want to know whether I can trust this test so in the Humphrey here you have three criteria fixation losses false positives and false negative errors this is what is given on the left hand side in a box now earlier we used to say that 33% uh, 33% and 20% that false positive till 33% are accepted false negative till 3% are acceptable and fixation losses we said no 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 it is completely wrong we have realized that even at values less than 15% false positives can play havoc with your fields that's why the current values are 20 20 20 that fixation losses false positives and false negatives of 20 20 20 are acceptable but we know that false positives even at 15% um, they affect the field so here if you see it's a perfect field 0 on 13 fixation losses have been checked 13 times um, and none of them in did it register then false positive 0% false negative 0% so this is a but you will not get such lovely fields such good reliability criteria so there will always but 20% is what you can accept according to theory if you have to answer in the exam but now come to this so what happens here is that you will find that the fixation losses are 13 to 14 uh, uh, almost 100 percent they are 13 out of 14 times that the machine checked the person had moved his eye but something else tells you whenever you get but the false positives is zero percent false negative is just two percent so when you see such a scenario be sure that you look where the blind spot has been plotted so most of you must have done administered a test to somebody and you will know that when the machine is first starting the test it plots the blind spot and that is the test when the time when the person is just learning getting his bearing right and in that time if the blind spot is not plotted properly then what is going to be happening is that every time and this is the blind spot according to the machine so every time the stimulus is presented at this false blind spot the patient is going to click the button why because the patient is not moving at all and the real blind spot which was supposed to be 15 degrees from the center and that is when you sh uh, when the stimulus was shown the patient was not responding so this means that 
the, there was faulty blind spot uh, uh, plotting at the beginning of the test and you this is a perfectly acceptable test always so only high fixation losses 100% fixation losses just go back and see you will be sure to find out that the blind spot plotting is faulty all right now what is the really okay this is a test where now it shows 6 by 14 fixation losses 25% pause, false positives 11% false negatives so this is definitely an unreliable test plus glaucoma hemiphil test also shows abnormally high sensitivity if you see here none of the tests shows any high sensitivity but be sure if somebody was monitoring the test any person who was monitoring the test would have found at least one to two values of 40 decibels come onto the screen and those values have been because it's a CETA standard those values have been changed by the machine after the test the, the machine tries to modify it tries to smoothen out the um, the anomalies of the test and in during that smoothening that those values of 40 decibels have been converted maybe into 34 29 35 you don't know but if somebody was monitoring the test the person would have known that this is abnormally high sensitivity and that's why the advice that please look in active look at the values when you are administering the test this is one more anomaly of a CETA standard if you see the standard the full threshold test they actually used to check for false negatives they used to actually check for false positives and actually check for fixation losses the current CETA standard all this is not checked the machine is guessing the, how does the machine guess the machine guesses oh, oh he is responding too quickly he is responding too late so depending upon the time taken by the person to respond to a stimulus the person the machine decides okay he is he, he, he is false positive he is responding too quickly he is trigger happy so it is and so whenever you are guessing sometimes you are wrong and this is exactly what has happened is that the machine has said that the false positive errors are only two percent so you would say that this is a reliable test only fixation losses so doesn't matter but you will realize that there is a big central scotoma uh, sorry white scotoma what is a white scotoma white scotoma is when the values are so super high see 49 44 i mean it's not humanly possible to see these kind of values so this is a white scotoma and this is one of the fallacies of uh, uh, CETA standard and CETA fast and CETA faster so CETAs but however because CETA stand, standard helps me so much in that in five in six minutes I am able to finish the test I am still sticking to CETA standard so you have to realize and yes glaucoma hemifield test is telling you it's an abnormally high sensitivity so along with earlier it was only fixation losses false positive and false negative errors but now even glaucoma hemifield test becomes an important criteria to find out if this test is reliable or if this test is not reliable so we'll go to the next uh, yes so having come to the criteria that yes this test is now reliable okay again 0 on 14 false positive 0% false negative 0% so it's the correct patient it is the correct uh, eye all that I have um, confirmed and now what do I do is the field normal is what I want to ask that I'm I know I can trust this field but now I want to know that the reason why I've done this test am I going to get an answer is it a normal and is it or is it an abnormal field so what happens is we divide this into raw data grayscale total deviation probab and and its probability plot and the total day and the pattern deviation numerical and the probability plot i will explain each of this in detail the raw data is the only thing which the patient has performed and the rest is all 
statistics what statistics is added so let me explain what is total deviation and wh what is the probability plot so you have to keep in mind that these are probability symbols probability symbols means what is the probability that this test is abnormal so when you come across this probability symbol it means that 95 percent of only 5% of people, less than 5% of people, normal people will have these values. This symbol means less than 2% of normal people will have this sensitivity. And this means less than 1%. And this completely dark black box means less than 0.5% of normal people will have this sensitivity. That means if less than 99.5 people are going to have the sensitivity that means the chances of this point being abnormal are much higher this is what the uh, this is what these symbols mean coming to now yes so this is the raw data of that patient which uh, which we are going to see what is total deviation so this is the raw data how do we derive total deviation from this raw data so this is the total deviation plot i have just enlarged it so i can explain it to you this is the patient's raw data and now the machine has a normative database so 34 look for the corresponding number here one it is not plus one it is one that means the patient sensitivity is better than the normal threshold by one look come to this value two and the value here is three that means the patient's sensitivity is better than the normative database by 2. So, in the normative database of this age, the sensitivity would be 31. In this point, 32, the patient's sensitivity is better than the normative database by 2. So, in most of n minus 1, what does that mean? Minus 1 here, 26, means in the normative database, the threshold is the, the normative database, the threshold here should be 27. But this patient's threshold is 26, which means it is less than, by the, by, uh, less than the normative database by 1. So, basically, what is total deviation? It is dif the difference between the patient's value at each point as compared to the value in the normative database. That's what a total deviation is. So, why do we need a probability plot? Now, I would say that, oh my God, this point is decreased by minus 1. How much should I worry? So, by giving you a statistical probability plot, the machine is helping you to decide how much should you worry about this patient. Now, if you see all these points, these dots are normal. That means 95% of people are going to have these sensitivities so it is telling you you do not need to worry at all you don't need to worry about this point nor do you need to worry about this point which is depressed by uh, two so i hope you have understood that what total deviation stands for so again i am repeating total deviation is the difference between the patient's values and the values in the normative database and the probability plot just tells you how much you should worry about this patient so in this particular patient you don't need to worry at all. That is what this tells you. Now, we will have another example. In another example, again, what I have tried to do is, that this is the patient's values. All right. And these, this is the total deviation, again, which I have enlarged. And when I have enlarged, now, um, just follow me. Here, the patient's value is 26. And it's minus, the value here is minus 6. That means, in the normative database, of his age the patient's value should have been 32 but it, instead of that it is 26 so it is depressed by minus 6 and if you so similarly if you apply you will come to know what is the normative database value this is 19 minus 12 means if you add the 2 you will get 31 so instead of 31 the patient's value is 19 so it is depressed by 12 so so forth each of these values are depressed and now the total deviation probability plot helps me in telling me sorry how much should i worry so the machine is telling me you have to worry about every point 
because every point is depressed to a degree where 99 i mean 0.5% of people will not have these values so again repeating total deviation is the difference between the patient's values and the normative database and the total deviation probability plot gives you an indication of how much you should worry about each of the point i hope it's clear now we will go to the pattern deviation now suppose we have a class full of children and they are very very naughty now if i have to send some people for remedial how do i decide which patient should be sent which kid should be sent for remedial are all of them equally naughty or are some of them naughtier than the rest and they require special attention so this is what a pattern deviation tells you so total deviation is the difference between the patient's values and the normative database and the pattern deviation is a different is an intra test difference so you can have a class which where you have children which are very very tall or very very naughty but in that population you want to find out which one are which ones are taller if you are taking tallness as a attribute or which ones are more naughty if you are taking naughtiness as an attribute now for example here it tells me that the total deviation probability plot tells me that this is a very highly depressed fields all the tests i i need to worry about all these uh, tests but i also need to know are there points which are more depressed than the others so this is what pattern deviation tells you the details of how pattern deviation is calculated is beyond the scope of this uh, talk so i have not got into the details but i just want to know want you to know that what pattern deviation checks pattern deviation checks within the test is there any unevenness that's what it checks and yes so here it tells me that total deviation um, is it's completely depressed all the points are depressed but here only few points are more depressed than the rest the rest of the points are depressed to or almost an equal degree but these points in the inferior field are depressed more than the rest of the field so this is what your um, pattern deviation tells you that in your test what is the irregularity i hope you have understood total deviation and you have understood pattern deviation now we will go to the yes again uh, it's a pattern deviation but a different kind of test like if you see here you will know this is a first of all you have to know that this is a 10 dash 2 how do you know it's a 10 dash 2 because the probability plots of course the machine tells you the printout tells you that it's a 10 dash 2 threshold test it's a seta standard test and you will have no probability symbols of less than 0.5% that is one um, uh, attribute of a 10 dash 2 it does not have that probability symbols now it is telling you that total deviation it is very very badly depressed each point is depressed to a level where you have to worry about now i want to know pattern deviation other irregularities so yes it tells you that the inferior field is very badly depressed and the superior field is depressed in the i am assuming this is the because this is the right eye this will be the temporal part this will be the nasal part so nasal field is depressed more as compared to temporal or to put it in another way it's only the temporal field which is paired pattern again total deviation is not telling you that it's pattern deviation which is telling you that only the temporal field is paired so it is giving you an idea of the irregularity in the field what does this tell you i'm just giving you a few examples so let's ask the question which machine humphrey which is the test seta standard 30-2 is it the correct patient i'm telling you it's a correct patient because this is uh, this is the blind spot it is going to be temporal so this is the right eye of that patient was that what does the total deviation tell you total deviation tells you that all most of the points in the fields are depressed 
they are depressed to a variable degree not all of them are depressed to the 0.5 level but they are depressed to a variable degree what does pattern deviation tell you so pattern deviation is telling you that the irregularity is more in the periphery as compared to the center so this is just trying to revision is the best way to imbibe something so just these two tests i had put as a revision to what we have learned about pattern deviation the same thing is here and now let's go to the other part so we have come to we have seen the patient's demographics we have seen the reliability criteria we have seen total deviation pattern deviation and now we come to the global indices so these which are mentioned here are called the global indices md stands for mean deviation and pst stands for pattern standard deviation though it is so you have to know that pattern standard deviation um, again like pattern deviation is related is related to local irregularity and the mean deviation is related to the generalized field is that clear so again i am going to explain it to you that most if all of you play cricket if you see that during the 2020 match a team has scored say 250 you know it's an excellent score you don't know whether one person made 100 Uh, or or each of them made 50 so you don't know but when you hear a score of 250 in a 2020 match it tells you that it's a good score it does not tell you individual um, performances but it does tell you it's a good score and if you find that the score is say 80 in a 2020 match you will know that it's a debacle so it could be one person who has made say maybe 75 runs and the rest of the team got out in five uh, runs it could be like that so it tells you it's a debacle but it does not tell you who failed miserably so similarly mean deviation is like the cricket score when you have a good mean deviation it tells you that overall the field is not very bad but of course you have to go and see if there are some small score to mark so even when you have a cricket score of 250 in a 2020 match there could be one batsman who's got out for zero there could be a run out for zero so you will not know that who played how but you know it's a good score so similarly mean deviation here is plus 1.04 which means it's excellent which means all the points are Uh, it's an av- now what is mean deviation mean deviation is the average of these points so you minus 1 plus 3 plus 4 2 2 you add all these points and you divide so it's a mean of course this is a i put it very simply but this is a mean of the total deviation so of if all these points are normal you will get a lovely very good mean deviation got it so this is what you mean by mean deviation and psd again is localized abnormality now in this particular test you have found that total deviation is normal that's why the mean deviation is good plus most of the times it's minus so plus mean deviation is a very good uh, number and plus psd is not high psd will never be plus it will not it does not have a, a sign in front of it so pattern deviation is low which means there is no local irregularity now let's come to the next now this field what does it tell you if you see the mean deviation is minus 15 and the pattern stevi- so it's high uh, when i say high i means it's depressed and the pattern psd psd pattern standard deviation is also high why is it why is the mean deviation high because look at the values here look at the values minus 4 minus 7 minus 12 when you have such depressed values obviously their mean is going to be minus so mean deviation so you know it's a bad score so when you have a mean deviation you know it's a bad score and when you have a psd of 14 you so that means there is lot of local irregularity so not only is the test very severely depressed 
there are also areas which are very grossly irregular that is what this tells you let us come to the third field if you see psd the mean deviation of course this is a bad field so the field is worse than what you saw earlier and that means the mean deviation has gone further down but why has the psd become low in the in the, earlier it was 40 now it is 6 why because now the field has become more uniform it has become horrible but it has become uniform so the local irregularity irregularity is less to just explain this point again i am going to say this is a road when a road has a very small uh, crater like this uh, a pothole sorry uh, when a road has a small pothole like this the mean deviation is going to be low and because the rest there is hardly any irregularity the psd will be low sorry if again you have this road where there are a lot of potholes the mean deviation is going to increase and because there is lot of irregularity the psd will also increase another scenario where there is a very large pothole here there is road with small potholes and this is one road which is single huge pothole the mean de- again the mean deviation will increase and the psd will increase but as the entire road becomes a pothole mean deviation will continue to increase but psd will decrease why because the irregularity less is less so i hope you understood this point of mean deviation and psd we'll now come to the yeah, global indices as i said mean deviation and psd pattern standard deviation have been there for a very long time but now there is a new one which is called the visual field index visual vfi visual field index which is supposed to be a better measure now what is the difference between vfi and um, mean deviation again vfi is like a cricket score even a vfi a good vfi the highest is 100% the lowest is 0 100 is good 0 is bad so what is the difference between a visual field index and a mean deviation in mean deviation all these points are treated equally no differentiation is made between the central point and the peripheral point whereas in a visual field index what it was made with the intention that the central points are more crucial to a vision and that's why more weightage should be given to um, those points if they become depressed and that's why visual field index gives more weightage to the central points as compared to the peripheral uh, peripheral points and that's the difference between visual field index and mean deviation next what is glau- glaucoma hemifield test again the details of glaucoma hemifield test you will get in a textbook also and that's why i'm not going into the details of this but the premise is that glaucoma respects the horizontal meridian so if there is a similarity a um, dissimilarity between the superior and the inferior fields that is what we should be able to detect and glaucoma hemifield test is designed to detect just that so and it, there are five possible values which it gives you within normal limits that means there is no irregularity between the upper and the lower hemisphere outside normal limits means there is a difference between the upper and the lower hemisphere there is generalized depression uh, means everything is depressed but there is no dissimilarity between the upper and lower quadrant and abnormally high sensitivity we have seen it earlier when the value threshold values are very high and borderline again the criteria for these five you will find in any textbook but right now we will just see that this is what it tells you now the poll question is in this field i have not given the entire data where do you think which is denser the superior scotoma or the inferior scotoma i am talking about the depth not the in, uh, the the in uh, the extent the extent is different and the depth is different these okay. are the results maximum i think 45% of the attendees think it's an inferior field which is uh, you know denser yes 21% think superior 27 thinks that it's equal and 6% of them cannot say great so 
okay one moment to please i'll just yeah now if you see if you do not even why i have put this question is many people they do not bother about even looking at the numerical values mm -hmm. what they do is they just see this black spots and they decide okay uh, this is a superior and inferior scotoma but if you see the extent of the inferior scotoma is certainly higher if you see here if you just look at the probability plot yes the extent on the of the inferior scotoma is more and the extent of the superior scotoma is not so much but if you do not look at these values here there is no way of knowing which is dense which is which is um, denser now so let me come to the next and that actually is the importance of raw data and grayscale that if you have the raw data and if you have the grayscale that is what would tell you that the inferior scotoma is way way deeper as compared to the superior scotoma so the same information you can get if you just look at the if you even look at the values in a total deviation but the because our eyes are trained in such a way that we just look at these particular areas and we say oh they seem to be similar but it's only when you see the gray scale earlier doctors used to say that the only reason why you have a gray scale is to explain to the patient and you and to keep your coffee uh, mug on it it's not so gray scale has such a beautiful visual impression it gives you so gray scale and raw data are the two things which tell you what is the depth of the scotoma so we have sort of seen all the attributes of a field report that is one is which are the laterality then the patient demographics the the reliability criteria then the total deviation pattern deviation global indices the glaucoma hemifield test and its importance and the importance of the uh, of the gray scale and the raw data all right so we have completed having seen the importance of each of this uh, um, uh, uh, of the things on the print out the second thing i will tell you is fovea off what is fovea off if you realize that there is a major fault in the grid pattern of humphrey in the sense that the central 3 degrees the tests are just not um, checked so that is why if you have a very very small scotoma in the central 3 degrees you will completely miss it and that's the reason why you if you keep the fovea on fovea uh, fovea on means the central the bank central the fovea is checked and if you keep the fovea off you will not have any point which is checked in the central 3 degrees and you will miss a small scotoma so that is Uh, fovea off and one more thing what i wanted to tell you is that octopus the test is very beautiful it is it is the points are more crowded in the center which are the more important areas and is they they spread out as you go towards the periphery and to sort of compensate for this drawback the uh, there is a test called newer test called 24-2c and 24-2c is a test in which in this central 10 degrees there are five points added in the upper quadrant and five points added in the lower quadrant to make up for this def uh, defect in the grid pattern of uh, humphrey so now with this information let us answer that question is this test normal or is it abnormal so now we will know anderson's criteria what is anderson's criteria it's a cluster of three non edge points in an expected location means if you see a notch inferiorly the defect has to be superiorly each should be depressed to a probability of 5% of which we will see um, this um, that in a this thing in a field field at least one should be depressed to a probability of 1% psd is 5% glaucoma hemifield test should be outside normal limits all this is theory now let's apply it to a field report so you know that it's a reliable field i know it is the it is the right eye of that patient 
total deviation what does it tell me that it tells me that there is a scotoma here a very mild scotoma in the periphery and a little denser scotoma so i would say how will i describe it i will describe the scotoma scotoma as an inferior scotoma of varying density that is how you describe it now i have this scotoma does it mean is it abnormal what how do i decide so one is you have to apply andersen's criteria so it's a cluster of three non edge points so yes we have a cluster of three non edge points non edge points in a 30 dash 2 in a 24 dash 2 every point is important so a cluster of three non edge points each of which should be depressed to this probability of which at least one should be depressed to less than 1% all right so again i am repeating a cluster of three non edge points each of which should be depressed to a value of less than 5% at least one of which should be depressed to a value of less than 1% in an expected location the glaucoma hemifield test should be outside normal limits and the psd should be depressed to a level less than 0.5% so these are the attributes of a glaucoma uh, of a andersen's criteria and if any field defect um, completes or successfully passes through this criteria it is deemed significant all right so this is just a guideline that does not mean now for example if i see a notch in the superior um, in the superior part of the disc then this inferior scotoma becomes very significant so this is what is indersen's criteria and that is going to help you decide whether this field is normal or whether it is abnormal coming to another another uh, field defect let's apply andersen's criteria so if i have to describe it always describe the scotoma that yes i have a superior scotoma in the total deviation plot i have a mild inferior scotoma again in the total deviation plot from when you go into the pattern deviation so again applying andersen's criteria i want to know is it abnormal is it normal should i pay attention to these field defect should i not pay attention so a the criteria are a cluster of three non edge points all of which are depressed to at least less than 5% of which one is depressed to less than 1% glaucoma hemifield test should be outside normal limits which is not here and the psd should be depressed to less than 5% does not fulfill andersen's criteria but that does not mean you disregard it if i have a notch in the disc inferiorly i will take this scotoma seriously but as i said repeatability is a hallmark of a true scotoma so if i have any doubts if my disc is normal if i have any doubts what i am going to do is i am going to repeat the test and if this in a repeat test this goes away then i know that probably it was not a true scotoma it was an artifact okay so this is how you learn to apply andersen's criteria i'm just showing you again and again so that we don't miss things again i'm telling you false positives are 12% here okay at 12% also it is going to affect the field in some way and this is i'm telling you whenever the defects are more in a pattern deviation as compared to total deviation be sure that the false positive is a little more and in the detail why it happens it is a very detailed discussion it's beyond the scope of this lecture but remember whenever the defects you see in a pattern deviation are more than the defects you see in a total deviation immediately put your vision here even though this says 12% but it has affected the vision that's for sure, uh, the field that's for sure so again here but in a pattern deviation criteria of andersen's criteria three non edge points each of them depressed below 5% one of them depressed below 1% glaucoma hemifield test 
within normal limits uh, it should be outer uh, outside normal limits and psd depressed to less than 5% so it is not fulfilling this criteria so that's why it may not be significant again you have to repeat it and then see so having come to the these are just different parts um, this is the last one three non edge points in a expected location all of them fulfilling the probability criteria glaucoma hemifield test is outside normal limits and the psd is depressed below 5% so this this fulfills anderson's criteria it's a significant field defect got it but again repeatability is the hallmark of any true scotoma so this is a clover leaf pattern clover leaf pattern is when you see when we play cards you you see uh, it has uh, it's a modified clover leaf pattern and that is the uh, when the person has been very very attentive earlier in the four cardinal points and then the person has lost his attention as the the periphery was checked that is when you get a clover leaf pattern that is one pattern and that's what do you say it's a hallmark of a unreliable test a rim scotoma rim scotoma is so common more common in 30 dash 2s as you go periphery the the points become depressed so this is again a rim scotoma and hallmark of a artifact so when you see this scotoma you know for sure that when you repeat the test as the patient becomes better and better at doing the test this will disappear now again is there a pattern this is a temporal side correct this is the nasal side if you will realize from the design of the test and this is the temporal so half of the temporal part is gone half of so this is called homonymous hemianopia why because here it's the temporal side which is gone and here it is the nasal side of the right eye which is gone so if you have to label this um, defect it is called a homonymous hemianopia what does this and which side is it it is on the left side means left hand side of each field is gone so the left hand side of the right field is gone and the left hand side of the left of the left eye is gone so it's a left sided homonymous hemianopia which means that this lesion is in the right hemisphere of the brain so i hope you understand that i am not talking about the right eye or the left eye it's the right side of each field so this is a left sided homonymous hemianopia and whenever you have a homonymous hemianopia the lesion is posterior to the uh, optic chiasma it is beyond it's in the optic radiation and it is affected the right side of the brain you can even diagnose it even without doing an mri which is this now this is there a pattern you are answering the question is there a pattern yes so here it's the temporal side gone of the left eye and the temporal side gone of the right eye so this is a bitemporal hemianopia and a bitemporal hemianopia is the hallmark of a pituitary lesion means where the optic chiasma is and the fibers are crossing so we have, we have asked we are answering the question does it follow a pattern so artifacts also have a pattern and lesions true scotomas also have a pattern neurological pattern they will respect the vertical midline and horizontal will uh, the glaucoma uh, fields will respect the horizontal midline so now again is there a pattern so we have answered the question whether it is abnormal or normal so this is definitely abnormal this scotoma so what is the pattern if you have to say a, what is the pattern you describe every time you describe a field you will clarify your thinking process whatever is written down your process your, your the clarity of mind increases so here i will say it is an inferior scotoma which tapers down towards this end with a broad base at the nasal side so this is a hallmark of a glaucomatous lesion so arcuate scotoma inferior arcuate scotoma with a broad nasal base and tapering at the end this is 
one of the glaucoma's cotoma so whenever you see however it's not only glaucoma even a brv or retinal vein occlusion will give rise to a similar scotoma a resolved optic neuritis can also give rise to a similar scotoma so just based on the scotoma please do not diagnose only neurological fields you can like a bitemporal hemianopia is diagnostic but these arcuate scotomas they are not there can be so many dds a temporal field is preserved more than the nasal field that is a hallmark even if it is a very 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 severely depressed field you will find in glaucoma the temporal field is preserved to a greater extent as compared to the nasal and that again is hallmark of glaucoma but again just by looking at a field you cannot diagnose if you f hmm. now this is again a 24-2 CETA standard why is the false negative not applicable because when it is very depressed you cannot the machine cannot calculate false negatives again the theory is given in a textbook but very severe fields you will not have false negative errors uh, uh, the percentage will not be shown what does this show total deviation shows a very severe depression and why does the pattern deviation show this the pattern deviation show this shows this because Pattern deviation is supposed to detect local irregularity. The whole field is depressed to such an extent that there is no local irregularity. So many times, this is an old printout. This is a printout of 2012. All right. The newer printouts, whenever the mean deviation goes below 22 decibels, the pattern deviation disappears. And that's the way it should be. Because many times people have seen, array, this is normal, go up. Way, the patient is normal so but no the patient it's it's not normal the depressed the fields is depressed to such an extent that the machine is not able to calculate pattern deviation again the theory is a little complex and i'm not describing it here but remember that when mean deviation goes below minus 22 in the newer machines the pattern deviation will go away completely it is only the the grayscale and this which is telling you that there is a, a flicker of sensitivity here otherwise the whole field is completely wiped out so with this i think we will go and stop but just to finish up uh, today's session let's just clear some doubts or some questions if the attendees have so uh, this is the first question now the, you did mention about dilating and performing you know the uh, the perimetry tests what you normally do what is the amount of addition do you normally put in young patients? Because there is, as we mentioned, there is no power, right? So what is yes. your recommended power you want to put in? If it's a fully dilated patient, I put plus 2.5 to plus 3. Okay. Yeah. In an emetropic patient, emetropic young, fully dilated patient, say a 25-year-old comes to me, I have dilated him and I'm doing the perimetry, I would put a plus 2.5 in an emetropic patient. If the person has a myopia of minus 3, I am not going to put anything. But if in an, in an emetropic patient, I will certainly put plus 2.5 in a patient who is dilated. Uh, does this answer the question, Himanshu? Yeah, it does. Fine, I think, yeah. All right. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the second question is, uh, what is your minimum cutoff value for the mean deviation and pattern standard deviation? Just to make sure that over this value we should consider it normal or abnormal okay i'll tell you what is the importance of mean deviation in a single field printout now one thing is just by looking at the mean deviation as i said as a cricket score i know how the uh, field is but however however its importance is more when you are looking at progression one second is if you are doing any kind of a study where you have to divide fields between mild scotoma, moderate damage and severe damage. So, minus 6, up to minus 6 is of mean deviation is mild scotoma, is a mild field defect. Then, minus 6 to minus 12 is a moderate field defect. And more than minus 12 is a severe field defect. So, mean deviation, I do not use to rule out normal and abnormal nor does anderson's criteria use mean deviation to differentiate between normal and abnormal so value of mean deviation is to get a general view a general feel of the field one second is to divide them into mild moderate severe and the third is 
to detect progression when you have said followed up the patient of over 12 years and you have at least 20 fields so you just see how the mean deviation is going if the mean deviation is going down you know he is progressing so for but however for a single field printout it does not have any value in ruling out normal or abnormal coming to the PSD PSD if as I said in Anderson's criteria if the PSD is the probability should be less than 5%. If it is less than 5%, then it completes Anderson's criteria and you say that this scotoma is definitely worth looking at. But again, beyond that, PSD does not have any value in diagnosing normal to abnormal. So, these are all useful when you are either doing a study and you want to classify the fields or when you are looking for progression in a field. That is the main importance of mean deviation and PF, pattern standard deviation. Okay. And uh, I mean, you did mention that you are looking for progression. So, just, just a connecting question. How often do you want to repeat these fields in glaucoma patients? Uh, sorry, I didn't follow. Sorry. Okay. How often do you want to repeat the fields, you know, to in, in glaucoma patients? How often do you prefer yeah. to do that? See, the uh, one thing, why do we want to repeat? One is you have to make sure you've got a good baseline. So, if I have doing the test for the first time, it's, it's a difficult test to do. So, I may not be attentive and my first time may not be very good. So, one is you want to get a very good baseline from which you want to uh, diagnose progression. The G European Glaucoma Society says that in the first two years you should have at least six fields. That means you should have three fields in the first year and three fields in the second year. This is what the European Glaucoma Society mentions. But if I am doing it for a person who is say ocular hypertensive and he has no field defect, it's very normal, then I will repeat it say maybe a year later. And if I have diagnosed a patient who has very advanced field defects, I will repeat it after say maybe every four months. So as I said, in a severe field earlier, say maybe three to four months, in a normal field, maybe a year. But initially, I will repeat it um, multiple times to get a good baseline. All right. One more thing I want to tell you that if the 24-2 is very severely depressed, you should do a 10-2 also. Do a 10-2 so you get a larger field to monitor. I think Correct. That Here you don't require fields to diagnose. You require fields to assess the amount of damage and to see whether it is worsening or it is staying stable. So that's why you need a better field and 10-2 or a size 5 stimulus will give you a better field. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I think there was one question on somebody did ask. I was reading up the chat that when to perform 10 2. I think you have already covered uh, yeah. that question as well. Yeah. No, one more thing if that is a question, then what I'm saying is suppose you see a field defect, as you said, uh, I mean, as I said earlier in my lecture, that 20 the, the problem with the grid pattern of Humphreys, the central three degrees are not checked, and very few people have the machine where you see 24 2 C, the 24 2 central C is for central where they have put more points in the center very few machines have that capability so that is why if you see the optic nerve which is grossly abnormal you are very sure that there has to be a field defect so that is also another time when maybe the 24-2 is normal but you go to the 10-2 and you will see a scotoma so there have been some studies where 24-2 was completely normal but because the authors were very sure that there has to be a scotoma here, they did a 10-2 and they found us. So, when it's a very advanced field effect, do a 10-2 and whenever you get a normal 24-2 but you are sure there has to be a scotoma, again do a 10-2. So, these are the two opposites when you do a 10-2. That's right. Yeah. Got it? Yeah. Okay. In fact, one of my uh, students, I had given this as a thesis uh, topic that when the 24-2 does not send in, uh, encroach in the central 10 degrees, how many of them have it on 10-2? So, it did come out that a significant number of people had central involved but not detected on 24-2. Okay. Yes. Okay. How often are event-based 
and trained based analysis used clinically to monitor glaucoma progression yeah prathamesh it's a very good question uh, what happens is what is event based and what is trend based i will just give a little introduction and event based is suppose i fall and i break my leg it is a one event and what is a trend if i keep on falling over a period of 10 years and keep on breaking my leg it is a trend so trend is something which you analyze over years and event is something which is seen over a short time we want we don't want to wait for 10 years to diagnose progression you want to detect it as soon as you get the first sign of progression you want to diagnose it so that is event based analysis is used for that kind of diagnosis and trend based analysis is used when you have been following up the patient for say maybe 5 6 7 years and that is why you have got enough data to make a trend of the psd you have enough data to make a trend of the pattern de- of the mean deviation and that is when you use trend both are equally important but trend based analysis you can generate only when you have significant data event based analysis you can uh, diagnose as early as in 2 3 years where two are used as baseline and after that whatever subsequent you do you can use it to diagnose progression so event based is short term trend based is long term and they are, they should be used all the time all the time Yes. Great. Uh, the next question is in terms of Humphrey, uh, with more faster test strategies available, can you comment on what scenario we should be using the threshold test, and which one will be useful in a clinical setting? That's the first part, uh, you know, of the question. And example, supposingly we are doing a threshold twenty four dash two, and we found a significant defect. This was, I think, you have already covered. Should we do a 10 days to see the fast to save time, probably in the next visit or something like that? If you want to comment. Okay. See, uh, to answer the second question, the second part first. When you do a 24 days to, and you find a significant defect, but if that defect does not affect the paracentral point, then there is no need to do a 10 days to, because you have found the defect which is not paracentral. But If you find a defect in 24-2 and it is affecting the paracentral point too, you should do a 10-2. And no, you don't do just a 10-2. You should do both every time on follow-up. You should do both 24-2 because you want to see if the periphery is progressing as well as you want to see if the central is also progressing. So you you should uh, so that is I have answered now for Humphrey with more faster test strategy. Can you comment on what, what scenario would the threshold? Test be useful. Threshold test. What CETA standard is also a threshold test. CETA fast is also a threshold test. And the full threshold test is the longest test that we just do not use. But yes, we are using the faster test strategy, the CETA standard. But I personally don't like the CETA faster, and I don't like the CETA fast at all. So the fast and the faster, I don't like. i like the ceta standard and the ceta standard gives a very good um, uh, balance between the time taken and the information given so the sensitivity specificity and the fatigue factor it covers all that so i would say stick to 24-2 uh, ceta standard if you are using humphrey and if you are using octopus i would say even the the 2 and a half minute or 3 minute the tendency oriented perimetry is fabulous so for octopus you can use dynamic also and you can use tendency oriented perimetry also okay and any experience on using swap so uh, short wavelength automated swap, perimetry yes now what happens is that swap came into being to detect things further but now with oct so oct and swap have basically the same uh, purpose to detect uh, defects before it is detected on standard white on white perimetry and believe me the swap is very difficult to do it is much much harder than even a standard white on white perimetry and it's a pain for the patients so that is why instead of doing a swab i would rather do an oct rnfl rather than do a swab so most of us have stopped doing swap altogether okay. 
Yeah, I think this is a connecting question. I'm just going to jump to the next question because since the OCT mention came up, uh, because of the, you know, OCT becoming famous now in clinical practices, you know, what do you think? Uh, is perimetry still uh, to be done or you think OCT can do our work? Yeah, that's such a lovely question because I was dying to say this. One is that <laughs> that we have so many tests to detect structure and function. Now, whenever you check any organ of the body, whether it's the optic nerve, whether it's a cornea, or whether it's your kidney or whether it's your heart, you have two types of tests. One test which checks the structure of the organ and the second is which checks the function of the organ. If I come to the kidney, if I do an x-ray of the kidney, if I do a sonography of the kidney, what I am checking is the structure of the kidney. But if I check the creatinine, I am checking the function of the kidney. So similarly, when you are looking at an optic nerve, OCT and all other imaging modalities, they are checking the structure. The function is checked only and only by the perimetry, no other test. You do not require a perimetry always to diagnose glaucoma. But to find out what is the extent of damage, how much should I worry about this patient? Perimetry is still the only test we have. So, whether OCT becomes better, perimetry is still an inseparable part of glaucoma. And other disorders, I would say I do not require perimetry to diagnose retinitis pigmentosa. I do not require perimetry to diagnose macular degeneration. But I do require perimetry to differentiate between different kind of optic nerve disorders. So perimetry is absolutely important uh, and it will remain so till we have any other test which will give us the function of the optic nerve. I hope that answers my question. And what are the pros and cons of doing both? I am doing everything. If I have a glaucoma patient or a glaucoma suspect, what I do? Of course, vision, slit lamp, bunioscopy, uh, central corneal thickness and OCT, disc photographs and perimetry. Every single thing which is going to help me monitor the patient is what I am doing. So, all these tests should be done for every person whom you suspect you have glaucoma. Okay. 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 That that really answers the question. And this is a bit of technical question. Uh, what does the dash do in in these? Uh, all right. Yes. Okay. Uh, all right. So that's such a nice question because I would say when you come across any printout, try to answer every question, every single data which has been given to you because there's a meaning. So what does thirty dash two mean? So initially, when perimetry was first started by Humphrey, they had two types of tests, 30-1 or 24-1 and 30-2 uh, or uh, 24. So the 2 is in the 30 or 24-1, the test points were on the X and the Y axis. If you see the test now, there are no points on the vertical and the horizontal axis. They are on either side of the vertical and horizontal axis. So because on 30-1 or 24-1, the points were on the um, axis, it was called 30-1. Now that has become obsolete, but the name has stayed. So 24-2 and 30-2 and 10-2 were the tests where the points were on either side of the X and the Y axis. So even though the, the 1, the 30-1, 24-1 has become obsolete, but the term 24-2 has stayed. I hope you understand. Yeah. 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 That's a nice question. Thank you. And uh, this is again another question in terms of... Uh, Patients with papillary edema, again, we were discussing about different conditions, not only glaucoma in terms of artifacts. Other than the enlarged blind spots, what other kind of visual field defects would you expect? If you have any okay. experience on that. Okay. It ranges from normal fields to enlarged blind spot to superior scotoma uh, or paracentral scotoma. You can get any kind of scotoma with papillary edema. The most common being enlarged blind spot and normal. Yeah, but otherwise anything. It only thing is yes. Certain times 
you are not sure whether it is papilledema or whether it is an ischemic optic neuritis so ischemic optic neuritis you will have a straight horizontal cut off which is called an altitudinal field defect altitudinal field defect you do not get in papilledema but it is like almost the hallmark of ischemic optic neuropathy a cut off line you know there is no uh, it's normal abnormal on one side that's how it is i'm i'm, I'm sorry i did not show one but uh, that's a hallmark so except for altitudinal field defect all other field defects you can see in papilledema okay and couple of more questions uh you did mention that you prefer to do it dilated any takes on if we let's say do it undilated any experience yes. on having patient is there any big difference yeah, that, in yeah. that's that's another uh, very nice thoughtful question that yes there would be a difference of maybe say one or two decibels but not more but you have to remember that you have to put an ad in a young patient if you do not put that ad then you will have a very very depressed field but if you put an ad then uh, there is not much big, uh, of a difference yeah. i think i kind of understand why this question comes if i may just add on because primary eye care practitioners i think as optometrists we probably are not uh, you know uh, allowed to dilate patients into our practices if we are working in an optical setup you know or uh, doing it without the ophthalmologist uh, hands over us so that kind of patient we may not be able to dilate in our clinical or primary eye care setup so, the only reason why i am dilating is because of logistic reasons yes. ideally it would should be undilated yeah got it so what you are doing is correct that's right yeah. Yeah. and uh, the next question is why we not why don't we consider peripheral point when we checking anderson's criteria why it's related to the central points is there is there anything you would like to comment on that i i did not uh, follow the question i think about the anderson's criteria i'm not huh? sure because we did we did I, I, the anderson criteria which you mentioned is the three cluster of points which are non edge non edge points yes yes but non edge points why is if you do a test yourself you'll realize that the peripheral points they fluctuate a lot and there is a, a why we not consider peripheral point where we check it is in a 30 dash 2 the outer ring is discarded why because those points are more prone to fluctuations and second is they are more prone to artifacts and that's the reason they are not considered in anderson's criteria but the peripheral point is certainly considered if you have done a 24 dash 2 yeah. got it so that's how we are not not considering in 24 dash 2 but in 30 dash 2 we are not considering and because those if you take those points you will find every field is abnormal because there is so much of artifact in the peripheral fields in 30 dash 2 the peripheral points sorry yeah So oh, it's it's just that in the thirty dash two the outer ring is not considered. Yes, outer ring is not not counted. So anywhere where there is a cluster of three points is is considered in in terms of yes, a cluster of three non edge points in an expected location. Even that is important. Like if you have if you are doing it for glaucoma and if you find that it's an inferior notch in the disc, then there is a superior cluster which you have to look for. So that expected location is also important. and i think we do have one question uh, which i i see on the chat let me just open up my chat and uh, yeah i think this is i think a natural question uh, because you said that you dilate the patient uh, for you know doing perimetry again uh, so do you make sure of uh, what type of glaucoma it is because we don't want to dilate certain certain types of glaucoma so right. any, absolutely any, Yeah. So I do a gonioscopy first. If the gonioscopy is open angle only, then the person goes to dilation. Otherwise, the person is first advised iridotomy. The iridotomy is carried out, and after that we do all the other tests. Okay. Okay. Got okay. it. Yeah. So I think that clarifies that uh, particular question. And uh, yeah, I think I, I we have taken almost all uh, relevant questions for today's session. Thank you, Doctor Priti, for you know 
taking up uh, you know giving us your time and uh, enlightening us with uh, visual field analysis thank you so much and thank you mr fakhruddin you are doing a very good job very professionally done um, i hope all of you have benefited i enjoyed it very much interacting with you and stay safe all of you and thank you once again uh, mr fakhruddin for uh, giving me this opportunity right Most see well. you again sir yeah is the entire team who is behind this so uh, the team ols and not only the team but all the our attendees to be very uh, you know interactive good you know taking yes. votes and i can see the chat is now getting filled up with thank yous and uh, a very good informative session so again uh, very extended thank you ma'am for doing this for us thanks and th and please be reminded that we are also in a process of having case presentation series so if you have any interesting cases students or clinicians or optometrists anybody who is interested to present any case please do visit our website and submit your abstracts we will have uh, the scientific committee look at it and uh, you will be scheduled and you will present it in different of the audience really soon so thank you everyone for attending we do have sessions planned next weekend until then be safe uh, i'll see you all again next week take care and bye 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 thank you for coming bye